I have here like a microphone. Check, check, one, two, one, two. Um, if you're ready, guys, I can, I can start. Um, so welcome. <laughs> it's, I guess it's the first time in this year um, we finally got the um, very nice, uh, very nice location. We hope it would be uh, permanent at least for a couple more meetups, so we can plan accordingly. Um, also, we may, how many of you heard about like Java 8? And how many of you used actually Java 8? Some some features. So you might be also interested. We, we were thinking about um, to, to do something like uh, install fast, so we can bring your laptop. We, we can install Java 8. We can hack some some new Java Java 8 features like lambdas or maybe even like an S4 itself. It would be like not, not the like like usual formal uh, presentation where we have like presenter, but it's like a collective like a hack when we can install. So if you have some thoughts about what you're interested in, just let us know. Probably we can ask your friend from the Oracle. He's from New Jersey somewhere. Okay. Uh, so he maybe he, he, he can come with some presentation about like Java, like something like 55,000 features okay. in 10 minutes. <laughs> you do that. I can actually tell you uh, any of you can consider it as a commercial, but it should be interesting for maybe for some of you. We created a new course, new training. Very practical training, modern way for developing web application, I think it's called, right? It's 10 lessons online. We will run it on Sunday. First group is already uh, completely uh, booked for February or another one. This is how it works. First three lessons, front end, is HTML, different way you think and how to do it properly. Then we move to the server side, plus all these uh, build tools, the gradle on the server, runs on the front end. We will use the telephone idea. So we'll create an application. It's very practical for people who know Java, of course, but who wants to do the whole cycle development of the HTML application. And it's 10, 10 lessons, right? So 10 three hour lessons on me, online. So. Yeah, but today uh, we're going to, to talk about like a very small, small part of uh, this innovation that will come into Java, Java 8, GDK 8, especially in Oracle, that would be like default. I guess it's a part of, of OpenGDK, so. And uh, this is the part called like Project Nesthorn, and uh, this is why I put like Java and JavaScript together. Um, so it's sort of like very, um, as many of you know, the Java and JavaScript, uh, they, they work together like hem hamster. So, um, and today I will try to uh, maybe remind some, some other thing, some very old things that are available since Java 6, for example. Um, and I will show some new features uh, that are available in the Nesthorn and what NES, you can use Nesthorn and Java GDK 8 um, in, in, your, in, your, in your real life. So I'll try to figure out like why you're here today. So first of all, because this topic has something like a JavaScript in, 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 in the uh, in the title, so I, I figure out you, maybe some of you is the uh, JavaScript enthusiast and uh, also you're really interested in new features of uh, JDK 8 and probably some of, <laughs> some of you is the uh, James Bond fan because you know my topic is about like the shaking and steer, you know this uh, famous uh, phrase from James Bond movie and uh, you know who is talking, this is the usual slide that uh, I, I, I put on my, um, on my presentation maybe some of you might know me. Um, I'm doing like software engineering, consulting, we develop applications. Um, we, we're doing lots of uh, like commercial development. We can you know, do lots of stuff. We're not going to talk about this. So also, I'm uh, the co-author of the upcoming book called Enterprise Web Development. Um, this book, like already Jakob mentioned, is available on this website. So today you can read ev everything. It's just, you know, we just compile this book from the trunk, so every, every day when we do some changes, some, some new stuff, it goes directly to this website. So every day is new fresh content. And eventually it will be uh, available on the stores. This also, <laughs> I'm also like a professional Russian, and this professional Russian, this is what the, uh, we do as a professional Russian, so writing the, the bears, uh, the Bolaika, and etc. Uh, yeah, so I, I try to uh, find the uh, the better way to, to introduce or, or to explain or to show uh, the why the, the, the polyglot development is important today. And this is why I put this slide, because as you already 
understand that I, I know more than one language and I know like more than English and I know Russian. So using Russian language, I can read the uh, Dostoevsky, Pushkin, Tolstoy books uh, in the original language. So I can, um, and also I can read the English uh, English books. I can uh, read the, the technical documentation. I can talk with the broader community. So, and in this case, the being the polyglot in you know in general sense will help me to be like to to communicate with broader audience of people to to talk to uh, you know people from different um, uh, from different languages, countries, and etc. So, and think about this, if you're being like a, uh, a polyglot with the programming language, you can also can get the, um, you know, different parts from different languages. For example, if you're a Java guy, and you know more than Java, you know, like Groovy, like, you know, JavaScript, and you're, um, uh, you have like a very broader set of technology that you can use to solve your problems or problems of your clients, so this is why I think the, um, the being like polyglot today, especially to be like modern developer, uh, you need to definitely know like more than three or four languages. And uh, today we're going to talk about another language that usually, uh, you know, very very popular. Right now, this couple more years, uh, we see very growth of the popularity of JavaScript again. Um, and as a Java developers, we can anticipate that. Um, the JavaScript is like Java, but a little bit simpler. It's, it's much simpler because it's just simple s scripting languages or something to make uh, snowflakes on the script, right? Um, so, but this is not exactly uh, uh, exactly true because uh, since the time when I started to uh, actually, I was uh, sort of fortunate to start. The JavaScript is not my first language, and I very fortunate about this. Maybe. This is my personal opinion again. And I think like language like C, C, Java taught me very, you know, right way to thinking about the programming and about how to write the software, how to develop like huge applications. So uh, when I came back to this JavaScript world, I tried to find um, you know familiar places for me where I can uh, where I can start uh, digging into it. and I start started with the like a unit testing, modularization, etc. So, and in this case, in the time when I, maybe it was like four years, when I used like a JavaScript primarily to, 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 um, to, to draw uh, snowflakes on the screen, I never thought about uh, that kind of concepts like, uh, like large scale JavaScript applications. So this is why this like word shit was, you know, buried under the, uh, uh, under the deep waters of the <coughs> different technologies. So now, uh, I can see, I can, I can, I can see this piece of technology a little different. So, and uh, the main thing you know that there is a, you know, JavaScript has actually so many parts, right? So, if, if you know, there's very two popular books. Um, uh, one book called the uh, JavaScript Definitive Guide. It's about like 800 pages. It's really heavy book. Like, not only for reading, it's a really heavy book just uh, by the weight. But uh, uh, another book is very popular, uh, written by um, Douglas Crawford, called the JavaScript Book Parts. As you can see, it's it's really teeny tiny book. It's about like uh, 150 pages, and you can read it maybe less than two days and uh, get all this best parts. But why JavaScript anyway? Yeah, um, JavaScript uh, is dynamic language, and uh, some pieces of J uh, this dynamic uh, nature of this language might uh, you know might create something like that in your uh, in this particular situation. What the, is wrong with this language? And if you're not familiar, I would definitely uh, recommend to see this talk called What? 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 So um, the guy, uh, Gary Bernard, he, he actually explores some very odd uh, things of JavaScript language. So, um, and the behavior of of these features, syntactical features of this um, of this beautiful language, is not precisely what you expect. For example, if you write in Java, you know the Java how how this application should behave. But when when it goes to like the JavaScript, it's not sometimes it's not very uh, obvious what is what's happened. So I definitely recommend it. It's, it's uh, very short. It's very fun. Um, it's worth watching. 
So, but today we're going to, uh, I guess, not reveal or like destroy this myth that JavaScript is only for browsers. So, uh, for many of you already know that uh, the JavaScript is not, is actually is everywhere. So, we know that there is like uh, Node.js. Node.js is the, uh, the server piece of software that uses um, Google V8 <coughs> engine as the you know, JavaScript engine, but uh, Node.js also has uh, the broad API to work with files, to work with the, um, um, the sockets, um, the different uh, like uh, low, low things, but um, this, so, uh, this is why I try to do this uh, distinction that uh, V8 is actual JavaScript engine, it's a very fast interpreter or maybe just-in-time compiler, but Node.js itself is a framework, it's a set of libraries and a set of APIs that you can use to write a server-side, not only server-side application, any type of JavaScript application. So you can write the uh, utility, shell scripts, anything, anything, anything what you want, even build scripts. So Node.js itself provides a very rich API for developers. And also, as a Java developers, we, we might know the, about the Rhino. Rhino was here very, very long time. So Rhino was developed by Mozilla, and uh, it was like one of the first implementations of the JavaScript. And uh, it is maybe many of you know that very old browsers were also written in Java. So this is why Rhino, uh, this is where Rhino came from. And now um, here's the, um, the next part. So uh, the two years ago, in the Java one, Oracle announced that they're going to they worked on this uh, JavaScript engine um, uh, called the Nest Core, and we will we'll talk about what is what does it mean actually. <laughs> first of all, so and for for this for this particular presentation for today, I come up with some uh, use cases that I uh, we, we might use this uh, Java Nest Core. Um, the JVM, etc. So first of all, we can use like like uh, for shell script. Like I mentioned, many people who use Node.js they use uh, Node as a framework to write in shell scripts or sort of like uh, utilities. Um, any 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 type of uh, automation for personal needs. Um, also, you can use the JavaScript to extend the functionality of your application on the runtime. So, um, because the JavaScript is dynamic language, it doesn't require to, to, to have like a compilation process. So, you can actually use the JavaScript as your domain-specific language if you need to have application that uh, that will provide um, ability to customize and uh, change the business logic without restarting the application, without restarting the application server. How many of you heard about the JRevel? So the JRevel itself is the very nice tool. It will help you to be more productive with Java. So JRevel actually will, um, when you write your code and uh, you, you deploy uh, it to your application server, you don't need to restart, deploy, and etc. So JRevel can recompile. Uh, actually, this is a part of the IDE. It will invoke Java compiler and will substitute the classes that available in the runtime. So it's also very, very neat, but what if you want to have th that kind of functionality without uh, third-party tools and without, um, you know, not only on the development environment because uh, JRevel itself is the uh, developer, uh, developer's tool. So in this case, uh, the JavaScript might be a very uh, neat tool to write like this uh, custom business logic. So uh, also, in, in some cases, like I already mentioned, that being the polyglot, you can uh, provide uh, API for developers who actually not Java developers. Uh, for example, um, you can, as a part of your application, you can provide just a, a JavaScript, uh, JavaScript API and uh, people that uh, want to use your application and they know JavaScript, they can use this. Um, to uh, execute some, some, some logic of your code. So it's also possible to use, um, to, to do uh, with the JavaScript. And also, um, JavaScript can be used uh, as the, uh, for, for the backend engine generation, and also I will demonstrate this uh, later, how, how it can be, uh, 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 how we can achieve this. So let's talk about briefly what is NASPORN. It's pronounced NASPORN because it's the German, uh, German word from the Rhinoceros. Rhinoceros. 
Is it, is it correct? Yes. <laughs> it's the, actually, uh, this guy. So this is uh, yeah. So this is uh, the Nashorn, and uh, uh, so first of all, it's uh, like a new JavaScript uh, engine. So I would, I would like to make a point here. This is just a JavaScript engine. It's not the uh, it's not the framework. It's not the uh, no GS substitution for JavaScript. It's just the interpreter uh, that uh, can, uh, you know, execute your JavaScript. And uh, this is 100% pure Java implementation, so there is no like a native hooks, uh, uh, hooks to uh, GNI or GNA and whatever. It's just a 100% uh, pure Java implementation. And um, this uh, engine is the 100% compliant with the uh, latest standard of the JavaScript language. So basically, the ECMAScript uh, 5.1 is right now. This is the standard, and this is the uh, how can you say? Is this the uh, standard approved? Because there's like uh, right now there's a work on ECMAScript 6, which will bring lots of new features in, in JavaScript, including classes, including modules. Finally, something, uh, something like that. But uh, right now, the ECMAScript 5.1 is the uh, um, is the current standard, let's just say. And uh, Nestcore is 100% com compatible with this. So, an interesting point about this is that um, during development of the Nestcore, the team uh, they used the same set of the benchmarks that uh, Google uh, V8 used. It's called Act 10. Uh, this is the set of JavaScript benchmarks for the uh, main uh, performance, um, different uh, the JavaScript constructs. Um, um, you, you can actually like Google if you see like a, another article on the internet that okay, so this browser beats another browser, so you, m most likely you will see this result of certain benchmarks. And right now, the Axan is the uh, de facto standard for uh, browsing, uh, te browser testing. To, to to benchmark and to um, to run some some, some code uh, to you know to check if it's like compatible or not. So um, also interesting point that uh, on the contrary to Rhino, uh, the Nestor itself it's not interpreter in general use because you know JavaScript itself is it, it's not compatible language, but um, when the Nestcore actually executing and uh, running your JavaScript code, it's not actually um, do interpretation each and every time. The first time it will analyze and compile and write to byte code. So in, in, in next time when it will call it and when you uh, will try to uh, execute, it would be actually uh, actual Java byte code. So there is no like interpretation. It would be actually on the on this. This is why this is why right now according to benchmark. Which marks the maybe not this is why it's my own, my own thought, but uh, according to some benchmarks, Ryan is still, um, especially for script loading uh, benchmark, uh, Rhino is still um, a little bit further than um, the Nesthorn, but for the rest of the benchmarks, uh, Nesthorn beats Rhino in 10 times, 10 times faster, 10 times, 15 times. Um, right now, they're working on to make Nestcore close to V8 in the performance. Right now, it's maybe like five times slower or three times slower, but uh, they are very smart guys and I think they will, they will get there eventually. And uh, as you might know, that um, in Work Dynamic, there is new concern the bytecode, um, bytecode, upcode that uh, uh, use created to in GDK7 and the slightly improved in GDK8 and uh, the Nescorn relied on the Dynalink project. Dynalink itself denied or uh, relied on the uh, invoke dynamic functionality. functionality. This is why uh, you cannot run the Nescorn on any JVM lower than GDK7. So, but also there is no plans and there is no no support on GDK7 uh, for the next one. So GDK8 and, and higher. Uh, the reason is that um, 
because of the invoic dynamic uh, uh, functionality that, that they are using is a little bit different between GDK7 and GDK8, and um, they said they don't have a plan to do backport. So there's a there's one backport is the uh, some community driven backport with the NS board, but uh, again, it's not uh, it's not supported officially, and uh, you know there's all, all, always a rule of plus. So what's happened when uh, this developer would be you know hit. By, by bus, uh, who who who's going to, to you know, proceed with this uh, backport uh, portability and etc. So forget about the JDK seven. So we're looking into the future. We're here, you know, to move in, into the future. So and uh, you know, it's very interesting, right? Uh, so what 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 all this all about? And how is used? How, how to use? How many of you use the scripting API for in, in JDK six? I guess. Maybe you used it for Groovy or running Ruby or Python. So all this, G, uh, sorry, JRuby, Jiton, yeah. So all these languages are provide the uh, the scripting engine that compatible with this API. So basically, you don't need to know internals of how to use this, uh, you know, the Netform or JRuby or Groovy or whatever. You're just using one common API. Um, the scroll on API has like just a bunch of classes and uh, it's really easy to it's very easy to use. Again, this is this is very old standard. It, it was available since GDK6. Um, and looks like right now everyone is, is pretty comfortable with this, so there's no like uh, uh, future GSRs or new problems with the um, the scripting API. And the, the, for most cases it's it's pretty um, you know pretty enough. Also, interesting thing, when I, um, when I initially started to do all this, uh, <clears throat> uh, this presentation uh, and I, I tried to figure out what like, the script managers available on my machine, I also find out that Apple, um, they have this uh, the Apple script, this little script that they're using to automate some pieces of the, um, well, you, can use the you, you can use the Apple script to automate different uh, different uh, parts of your workflow. You can start application, post application, different stuff. It's Apple. Um, Apple Script also provides the uh, implementation for GSR to the three. So you can actually run Apple Script from the, your Java application. So also um, uh, the Nest form uh, and uh, again, basically thanks to this API, you can easily pass objects between. Java and JavaScript, you can inject your objects into your uh, JavaScript. You can uh, read some data uh, from the JavaScript uh, uh, code and etc. I will show some code later today. So, from the JavaScript perspective, inside your JavaScript code, you can also use not only uh, available libraries for JavaScript, but also you can use all, all full blown like GDK stuff. So you can use whatever you want to use. If you want to use in, inside the JavaScript, if you want to use, I don't know, some um, GDBC for example. I have the example. I will use the GDBC and I will use the I will load the um, GDBC driver from from the, my, uh, the JavaScript code and uh, so many things that could be done. But the more, more important, you can also not only uh, uh, do uh, you know, instantiation, you can actually extend, extend Java classes, implement Java interfaces. So it's, it's lots of things. Uh, it's not uh, maybe uh, uh, vanilla JavaScript anymore, but again, uh, having this um, dynamic language without recompilation, right, using Java features, it would, might be awesome. So, and uh, to better illustrate uh, ideas and better illustrate the things that um, I wanted you to look into, I, I come up with some, maybe three stories which I heard from different people or maybe not, maybe I just uh, you know, come up with them, uh, maybe some of them come from my uh, um, my professional life, so when I was when I consulted, okay. I got some crazy requests. So, and the first one story is the, the story about uh, lazy support engineer. So there was a guy. He he was a very 
Um, yeah, he, well, he was very lazy because he, he, he actually uh, he don't want to make uh, to do something twice. He he can spend like uh, uh, maybe two three hours uh, to uh, to find a solution that can solve your you know your application in two three seconds. So solve this task in two three seconds. Uh, and the next time he don't want to do this repetitive task to to accomplish this, he will just reuse his his script. But um, he also, um, he, he very server-side guy, he uh, never did lots of programming. But like I said, uh, many of us, we did this, you know, snowflakes on the screen or moving the, uh, um, the, the square on the screen, you know, this, uh, with the easing effects or, you know, uh, you can put the button on the screen and try to, you know, say, click on this button and button will uh, always run from this mouse. So he, he sort of knew something about JavaScript. And uh, one day uh, his manager asked him uh, to, you know, one day he had a manager ask him about some, some reports from the database. Another day he asked him about uh, another report. And uh, he was, you know, because he's lazy, he tried to find a solution for this. And because there were so many databases in the in the company, company when he, he worked, he, he, don't, uh, he didn't want to have uh, some um, just you know solution for each and every database. He wants to have some some generic, generic solution. And for one of the books or for one of the um, uh, the, the things that maybe he asked his uh, his colleagues about, and he learned about the GPC. GPC is pretty. Um, Pretty obvious thing, right? It's the, just the common interface to any database. If the database provides JWC driver, you can execute uh, um, pretty much the same set of the APIs to get uh, to get work done. So what what he came up with, he decided to mix his knowledge about uh, shell scripting, knowledge about uh, uh, JavaScript, the knowledge about the JDBC and databases. So he uh, actually came up with some uh, very interesting uh, shell script. Um, let me, first of all, something like, so basically there is a, he come up with very simple shell script file called database.js. So, and, can you see the screen now? Yeah. Okay. Alright. So, um, as you can see here, um, the file has the GGS extension, right? But we're starting with the, this file as the shell script. So let's uh, let's take a look inside and try to figure out why uh, why it's happening here. So here's the part of this uh, uh, the database uh, related uh, uh, database related code. Um, with the Java uh, with Java eight and uh, there would be also one more. Uh, useful utility will be available for you. This utility called um, JJS, which says like a Java JavaScript, uh, because uh, all utilities in the Java they start with J, so they decided to do it like a JJS. And this is actually um, the common line interpreter. So um, you can pass, you can start this JGS and start typing some JavaScript evaluation. It's called REPL. Um, many of you, you know, know this. This is the many scripting languages give you the REPL. So when you use the Python, Ruby, or even Groovy, when you start the Groovy shell or Groovy console, um, you will get this REPL. Um, same here available for the JavaScript. And after that, um, this script would be uh, you, uh, will use this GGS as the uh, interpreter for this shell script. Another interesting um, interesting part of the of, of, of this uh, of this script is that you can also uh, um, there is a set of predefined um, um, functions I would say uh, one of them is load which allows you to um, to to load some external JavaScripts. In this case, there is uh, this JavaScript file has some. Let me put the cursor here like this. Um, allows me to uh, to to load some um, some JavaScript stuff. This is this is fi this file is 100% JavaScript stuff. Is nothing to do nothing to do with the uh, with Java or anything. It, this this 
let me open this file. So what it does, it, it, it uses the, it uses the uh, ability of JavaScript to, I, I would say this maybe it looks like meta programming in, in other languages like Groovy, but uh, also you can change uh, some, some features of uh, already predefined objects. In this case, um, I, I'm adding to any string in JavaScript ability to behave like uh, uh, the, the string template. So, and how, how I can use this? So, in this case, I have this, uh, the message, and uh, inside here I have some placeholder, uh, placeholders very similar to, to what you usually do with this uh, um, the formatting string in Java. But instead of like using the percent %s or uh, other, other symbols, there's a, uh, this, this is the notation. Also, like I already mentioned here um, in, 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 my, in my slides, that um, we can also load and use Java classes. So, uh, there is uh, that kind of uh, the keyword that allow you to, or to tell to JVM to load this class. Um, so, in the same, the same story, so I'm, I'm loading driver manager because I want to um, work with the um, GDBC connections. And uh, also, uh, I don't know why I'm doing this, maybe it's not required. So, next thing, I'm doing absolutely the same, the GDBC related code. Uh, we need to get the driver for the connection from the driver manager. Um, the, uh, first of all, we're also loading uh, we're also loading the, um, uh, the GDBC driver and we can easily change the script and uh, get um, a different output. For example, I want to, if I want to change my GDBC output, I will get only a query that will uh, select only companies. Uh, as you can see, there is no like a compilation or it's just, I'm just changing this uh, just, just the script and this executes almost immediately. Um, there is no compilation, there is no like a Java C stuff, and there is no even like public static void main. Or if I want to again return back to, to this representation also, uh, this the, the, to this script, it will also print out um, the, the result. So what I'm trying to say here, um, using this this ability. Uh, this functionality gives you, again, many of things here. I put here because I, I, I used it in Java, so if it's, there is some, some sort of exceptions, I need to try to, uh, try to catch them. But in JavaScript, you don't have to do this. So the, basically all this uh, error handling me mechanism or error handling stuff, uh, it might be not included here because you know there is no like a uh, uh, check down check exception here. There is nothing, and uh, you can you can try to catch if you want to. If you don't want to, you you, you might not. So and uh, depend of this uh, what you're trying to do with your uh, with your code or your JavaScript uh, script. Um, it, 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 it might be like so many things that you can do. For example, for example, uh, there is a, a example of uh, how how to use the uh, the lambdas. Um, many of you, uh, I show me so many red marks. Probably it doesn't understand this well. So the idea is here. Um, this script actually contains. Uh, invocations of some uh, APIs that would be available in GDK8, especially for uh, it's called um, the batch, batch operations on the collection. So um, uh, you can you can work with your collections in more like a functional styles. So you, you can uh, do like map, reduce this such of stuff. And uh, for example, if you use Groovy, you you know that uh, there's uh, things like um, um, you, you, you can do pretty much the, 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 the same functional approach. You can do uh, 
collect a map use do, do the parallel stuff so now now starting in March uh, you will you will have this ability in Java also and again in this JavaScript in this uh, JavaScript script I can I can use this uh, lambdas things because it's the you know and you, I can use the streams it's also a new concept uh, in uh, GDK 8 um, and all these things are available to you as a Java developer but it's 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 the, the dynamic and the very um, very cool stuff to, to, to play around with. Um, so hey, by the way, you can interrupt me. I don't want it to be you know just a monologue. You can ask questions. You can interrupt, and I can. I have a question. Yeah. Okay. In Rhino, I remember uh, Java dot land was automatically imported. I mean, we didn't have to import anything in Java dot land. Is that not the case anymore? Or I don't know wrong. Um, are you talking about like you th th things, class, right? things like I, I I don't know why I did this because probably I I couldn't find the better syntax in that point, but um, anyways for Java classes you need to use this Java type if you want to use it explicitly. Some of them might be available uh, implicitly, uh, but it's always better to make sure you know because uh, there's no like the object type types in, in JavaScript. So in, in this case, uh, the uh, in, in particular moment, the object in JavaScript might be compatible with some certain type or might not. Uh, it's, it's very dynamic and uh, it's, it's better to make sure because you, you cannot say there's no like a type annotation like we use in Java. There is a, you know, we have a type and after that we have the variable name. There is no such thing. We have this just a war and uh, we, we cannot say the, the type uh, of this object. Actually, we can. There is like a, that, that um, uh, instance. Instance of what's the uh, what's the keyword? Um, but it will give you just you can do comparison if if you, if you have the some object that you can compare with what type this object, and you you can you, you can do the comparison, but you cannot get the type. Of this uh, of this object. Any other questions? Okay, so let's go to um, really fun stuff. So the f uh, the we here in New Jersey, and uh, we we had our client from the New Jersey. He was the he was working on the waste management company. He, in one day, he decided to you know automate some process to work with IRS, and um, you know to to get some. You know, calculate some taxes and submit these taxes on, in, you know, in the new way using these uh, computers and stuff. But also, there's the same problem as uh, I faced with the previous story that uh, no one's like Java because everybody uh, who heard Java thinks that it's you know slow and uh, no one, nobody wants to learn Java because it's uh, so many things in Java. But uh, everybody knows JavaScript and uh, of the you know the. Uh, um, the head of this uh, company, he said that okay, so my, my son knows JavaScript, and uh, let's let's use the Node.js or something like that. I heard this this Node.js thing, and uh, I said well, why 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 to use Node.js when we can use the, you know all this JVM stuff and everything available for us, and uh, Glassfish is a very awesome application server. Um, so let's let's uh, use the Java, but. This guy can can still write the uh, can still write this uh, uh, in JavaScript. So what's the, what's the idea here? So um, in, in this case, uh, we come up with some some pretty pretty neat UI that should you know display the information about the taxes. But um, as a part of the custom business logic, this calculation of taxes should be uh, should go in different rounds in terms of, in case of different people. So in this case, uh, if it's like a Tony Soprano, we need to calculate taxes differently. So in this case, um, I also uh, come up with these um, JavaScript. So this is all. Uh, this is all business logic that uh, you see on the screen. So this is all business logic that cal cal calculates the, the the taxes. And as you can see, it's the there is no Java here. This is just 100% pure JavaScript. 
Uh, are you guys able to see the road? It's good. It's good. So, um, and there's no like a Java specific thing here. It's just 100% a JavaScript. But um, as you can see, if the customer name, so we, we're doing we're doing the taxes. So in this case, we have uh, the object called tax, and we're also assigning the method called do taxes to this object. And inside this do taxes, we need to based on the income and the customer name, we need to calculate uh, his uh, his taxes. But in case of the Tony Soprano, um, we need to use the thing called like a Mafia Special. So in this case, we can uh, you know we can use a different uh, different a little bit different logic. So so in this case, um, uh, one day they decide okay, so it's it's works very nice, but uh, we want to have it some something like a RESTful web service. We want to have output or into the JSON uh, instead of like just a plain text. So in this case, uh, as um, as many of you know, the um, the JSON is the uh, JavaScript object notation. This is the way how to describe the uh, JavaScript object, and uh, the part of the, the JSON creation framework. Uh, let me ask you, uh, what uh, for JSON framework are you using for Java? If you're using it on Java. Yes. Yeah, so you see, there's already two different versions. One of you using Jackson, one of you using JSON, and there is a, also a, a JSON.org version. There's a bunch of different things, but in JavaScript world, this is the standard feature, and the standard feature called uh, this um, JSON. That's it. So if you need to um, serialize your object into JSON, you just need to do um, like if you need to get the string representation of the, your JavaScript object, you need to run the um, just a um, 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 just a JSON string string uh, string string stringify, and uh, it will it will produce the JSON. So in this case, let me uh, once again show you what was before. And again, so the same thing. And now we want to represent it as a JSON. Boom. As you can see, there is no restart of the server. There is no. Um, Everything goes immediately because, you know, this script executes right right away and uh, executes right now. If I want to have some other person here, um, and uh, <coughs> also I can pass this parameter as the parameter of the HTTP request, but uh, I need to, um, you know, it, 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 it also could be done. So in this case. I just need to refresh the screen, and uh, we're already in the PHP style world. <laughs> it's a PHP style programming and resource side application. So, using the JavaScript, um, first of all, give you um, uh, you, give you ability to write like a really dynamic application, and use things that are available in JavaScript by default. Speaking about the yep, I was wondering, you know, what is that a server container, or how is it? Being exposed over the web. Mm -hmm. So, uh, idea is pretty simple. Um, I'm running the glass fish here, but uh, this is not the requirement because I guess at the time when I started to work on the, that presentation, the glass fish was the only one container who can start with GDK 8. So, this is why I use glass fish. And uh, another thing, I have just um, script. There is a script and resource. So this is the... How many of you are familiar with the JaxRS? So this is the... Also JaxRS is the standard way how you can write the RESTful Web Services application in Java. So in, in, in my case I have these, uh, the path defined called script and the base the file name is the part I'm passing through the, um, the URL, um, if you can see here. And uh, I'm, it, it just looks at a particular directory and uh, looks inside. So for example, if uh, let me check what I also have in this directory. In this directory I also have a bunch of things. For example, ls.js. If I run this ls.js, so it will print out list of the files in in 
in directory on the application server, where my application is deployed, sort of. But um, it, it's not maybe entirely true because this this script is not actually trying to find the, the like actual location. This is just default location of the Glassfish. If I try to run the same LS script uh, in this particular directory, so when I do something like ls.js, it, it, it do what it says. So it's actually print out stuff from the current directory. And uh, if you can, see, if you want to see the content of this. Um, uh, ls.js file. It's a pretty simple piece of Java code, right, inside the JavaScript. So you know there is a file API that you can get uh, the, um, uh, the uh, if, if you pass like a dot, it will give you current directory, and uh, you can get uh, like a full pass, and you can iterate over the files in this uh, directory. Uh, speaking also about default stuff, this print function is also available out of the box. And if um, if you need to just print something, there is no like a console because there is no like browser. There is no nothing. So the print uh, is used to actually output something on the on the uh, on, on, on on the on the shell. I have the same exact question. So oh. Okay. I have a follow-up question. I noticed the script cache. Um, is it something similar to like a dev mode JSP where? It compiles. No, no, no. It's just uh, this this part part of uh, this part of uh, where is the research? Yeah, this is just my own custom logic. This is I you know designed this class. It's nothing to do with this. Uh, is it possible to compile and re-execute it later? You know, something similar to JSP where we compile once and then <coughs> we reuse it all the time. So, uh, like I already mentioned, during these. Um, uh, during the maybe live in JVM, when you already evaluated the script using this uh, API called, I'll show you. There is some API called. Let me put it somewhere else. What's Mary? Okay, this is. Do I have no? I have it here. I'll just show the, how this API looks like. So um, the engine. This is my this is instance of the Nashorn engine, and this engine engine um, the script manager. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. It's different. Yeah, script engine. Script engine has method called eval. When you run eval, it's actually evaluating your uh, JavaScript. But on the contrary to Rhino, it's not do evaluation over time. It's do compilation of the bytecode. The next time it will just reuse it. Another thing which is available is the part of the standard API uh, from the GSR 3 It's called compile script. So basically, inside your engine, uh, there is an interface called come come. Oh, let me let me better do this. Java and find me compilable. Yes, there is an interface, and uh, most of the uh, most of the engines in implement this interface, uh, um, the compiler interface. So, and there is two methods in this interface called compile, but you know they are uh, the similar. One of them just gives the string uh, script as a string. Another one that will give gets the the reader, and it will produce you. Uh, it will give you the uh, object called like compiled script. So you can, uh, re without evaluation, you can use the result of the compilation. But uh, as far as I understand, as far as I uh, already have spoken of the Nesthorn guys, maybe it's not, it's not that important anymore in terms of Nesthorn because it, by, by the end of the day it will be bytecode, even if you run the eval. So if you want to save this somewhere in your memory and use on a different part of the application, you can do this. I'm not sure. Some people do. They just you know serialize the bytes of this compiled script into somewhere in the database or file system. I don't know why they want want to do this. There's no like uh, huge benefit in performance, but you can. So there's a facility. You cannot 
you cannot use this compiled script in with other engines. For example, you cannot pass this compiled script, for example, from Nesthorn engine to Groovy engine. But uh, you can uh, you can use it more than one one more than once in different piece of location if you use this compiled. But if I'm returning to your question, initial question, this. this Share, uh, the script cache is my own stuff, so I try to put the same the same thing. What probably you might want to do. So I have this just the, the hash map, and inside this hash map, I have script name and this uh, the compiled representation. It's pretty much the same. Um, another thing. In, uh, anyone else has any question? So another interesting thing is okay. yeah. Do you run this as a web application? No, it's just uh, just a plain Java application, no tricks. It's not durable. There's no durable. So Glassfish, uh, what is that required? Hmm? Glassfish is uh, absolutely. Yes. So do you, do you require that to run this? No, no. It's just my personal preference because I I like you know easy way to to write stuff. I, I like the annotations. I like to write the rest of services. Just you know put annotation, blah blah blah. No zero XML. Everything works. Um, so it's, it's just it's just my personal preference. Uh, for for example, for the for upcoming course, uh, we we decide to use the uh, the GBoss uh, Wildfly. It's the another cool application server, and the version eight is also like a GLE seven compatible. But like I said, on when the very beginning when I started working on this stuff, the um, Glassfish was was the only one who can you know run. So on these GDA. are like a kind of like standalone uh, application. Right? Yes, it's application so server. So it's a uh, container. Glassfish is a container. So this one, like whatever you write on the code, is that a web application? Yes, it's correct. Standard? Yes, this is the web application. Uh, I will share the code after the presentation. Yes. I will I will give you the link and you can uh, you know poke around and see what uh, what I'm doing wrong here. So another interesting thing that um, available to you as a developer, you can actually do passing objects, Java objects inside the script. So in this case, um, I have this object called uh, JSON, and I want to, you know, let's first of all let's see what it print out. Um, when I do see here, it's called environment.js. Environment.js is print this uh, JSON with information. Uh, let me put it on the screen. It's better here. Yeah. So what what it does is just uh, involves this. Um, and once the server and just print out the response into console. It's, it's, I, I found this more, you know, you, you, you can read it better. So all this information that are available inside this uh, as a value, so this JSON object is actually comes from the J uh, Java runtime. So when I do, when I do in my uh, resource. I'm preparing. I, I'm populating the information uh, with the, uh, for example, the uh, each and every JavaScript file, a JavaScript uh, script that would be run in, in, inside this um, inside this engine needs to uh, needs to have the some sort of the context so the context is defined some uh, some variables that you, you can pass around so in in this case one of the uh, the attributes that i want to assign to this context is called the request so i want to pass the value of the request object for whatever reason so in this case i want to get this uh, full path uh, Inside this JSON in, in this script, so and I'm passing this as the inside my script. This uh, instance of request will be available uh, with this request available. So if you will go here, environment.js, and we'll see here. In this, in this particular case, I will uh, I will get this uh, request, and I can invoke. Actual method and the 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 Nest horn, uh, will will do all this stuff for you. So it will do all this marshalling between Java and JavaScript, and uh, this invocation will happen. Eventually, uh, you will get this um, you know this uh, this value inside the uh, URI uh, URI value. 
Another thing that's also uh, available here, where is it? Resource. I can also pass. Uh, where is it? So the the variable called the factory. The factory. Uh, this is the object that available in the GSR223 API. And using the factory, you can create uh, or get instances of a specific um, description. Uh, in this case, the, the I use this factory. And the API of this factory is, let me open it, script engine, script engine factory. And uh, the API of, of this guy, there's a bunch of information available uh, about, um, about the state of this, uh, about the state, about the environment, about the scripting engine, etc. So using this factory, first of all, you get an instance of the um, of the engine, and also it can provide some some different information useful. In this case, in case of this application, I'm using this information in where's the environment? Sorry, um, I, I, I'm using this information to get information about the actual what we actual run in. in. Um, also, it's also dy very dynamic, and I can do change everything here. I can add new properties, for example, blah, something, test, and without any restart of the server, when I invoke this, this property will be available here as a part of the response. Same, same, same stuff. Uh, it will be evaluated uh, when when you get this uh, request. Um, in case of a really big scripts, you might want to figure out the sub-optimization, like you, you already asked about. Maybe you don't want to evaluate the script each and every time. But uh, for example, personally, I'm using this approach here to demonstrate how you can write some sort of uh, the old pro for your environment. For example, you deploy your application into production and you don't have access there. You, you, you cannot uh, log into the Unix server and see what's happening with your Java. But uh, if you provide yourself with such a, such endpoint when you can execute like a, I'm not saying arbitrary JavaScript code, I'm saying you know what you do because you're professional and uh, you know you need to secure this thing and uh, you, you don't have to provide it, uh, the, the public access to this endpoint. but for you know some sort of like a monitoring or some some getting some information about your system, it's very neat tool to, uh, to maybe very neat framework to write such a, such a tools. Um, what else uh, I do have here? So um, and this is the also like I said, this is just a simple, a very simple, uh, very simple test a test uh, test file. Let me show you this test file also. So interesting thing, in, in this script, I invoke in this uh, print method, but a uh, result of this I see on the page. The reason is that, that in, in your execution context, you can change sort of output where this print can print stuff. So in this case, um, I'm just uh, substituting, uh, I'm just uh, substituting the writer for this script execution context. I'm uh, substituting writer with my string writer. And after that, I will put a result of this, uh, s you know, just, just a string from the string writer right to the response. It's also a pretty cool thing because um, this script, JavaScript, uh, JavaScript script, um, you can test it using the, uh, the command line shell, and after that you can put it on the on the web, and uh, without changing the code of this JavaScript, it will be uh, behave the same uh, in the same way. As you can see, um, is ls, for example, um, it can execute. 
stuff here and I can execute a less on the oops, on, on the server side and uh, I, I did the same same script but uh, just with different output so in this case it uses output of the uh, of the response of the request HTTP request and uh, here it uses the console for output and any questions so far we good Okay, and uh, the last one. So, how I can use like an S form for the browsers? You know, we definitely had, I, I put here an S form in browser. No, it's for browser. So, it's not actually running the browser, but it can uh, generate some content for the browsers. So, how many of you heard about uh, the, the client side scripting templates uh, or client side templates like the mustache? Um, uh, handlebars, uh, dust, whatever. So, yeah, nice. So, uh, you, you understand that. Right now, the uh, engine and uh, the browsers right now, they're very powerful to execute arbitrary, not arbitrary, like big, big chunks of the JavaScript. And even you can do templating logic in, in, on the client side. But um, another a very um, popular opinion or popular um, thought in, in people who actually uh, for like Node.js, I think they might say, okay, I'm writing my JavaScript on the server side, on the client side, and I have um, on the client side, I can reuse the stuff. The, with these, um, the, the scripting API, you can do pretty much the same. And um, in case of, this is this very, very interesting use case. So. You have, you a very talented JavaScript guy, you know these front-end technologies, you're using these uh, templates, you can write like really cool and a very, very large scale application. But uh, as, an enterprise, uh, as an enterprise developer, you know that you can't afford to, to use latest browser technologies, you need to stick with very, very old uh, technology and you need to support them. And in this case, what you can do, you can Put some, <laughs> put some um, load of execution of JavaScript, not on the client side, but uh, leave it on the, on the server side. So in this case, your cool guy uh, who developed these uh, templates for the client side, um, he, he can give it, and uh, you're not going to throw away his results. You just recompile the, the, these templates on the, on the server side and uh, just feed the, uh, browser with the plain HTML. So, and um, uh, I'm talking here about uh, the templating language called Dust. Um, um, this is it was like developed in some in some uh, some guy from the community, but uh, it was picked by LinkedIn. And right now, the PayPal they're using um, the same approach. So what they do, they not they're not actually using the GSPs. They, they throw away all this backend that was related on the GSPs. And uh, on the server side, they have only just uh, RESTful endpoints with, with data. On the client side, they have uh, JavaScript and they have these templates. These templates, uh, let me open the uh, template and you will understand what I'm talking about here. For in this case, I have, for example, this is my template for 404 page. So, how this template looks like, you can put whatever, uh, you know, anything, any, any part of the format, but uh, also you want to eventually, you want to populate these um, templates with some values. So in this case, uh, um, it uses this, uh, you curl the braces as a, to define the placeholder, and uh, based on this placeholder, you also define the a name in the model that would be applied into this template. So in this case, uh, if we want to populate this, um, this uh, template with data, we need to provide uh, some uh, JavaScript object which, uh, which has two, um, two properties, title and error. So in, in this case, I would say I have the JSON object that will be merged with this template and uh, the, the result of this, of this page we can see um, on the on the screen so 404 
So um, if I was uh, open the source, it, it was absolutely the same thing that I show you with the template, but uh, these placeholders were populated with the values from the JSON object. It's, 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 it's pretty neat. Um, um, it's, you know, you, you might say, okay, Victor, we already know this, uh, we did this for a year because it's, this is what GSP does or Spring VC does. Yes, correct, this is just another approach. And um, in some cases, this approach can be used as a fallback. Like I already mentioned, uh, if you develop or another, uh, uh, your teammate develop very nice stuff and it's very front-end oriented and you have like a server uh, just for, for, for data, uh, and you don't want to, you know, turn his template back to JSP again. You want to have uh, um, the consistency, and you want to stay on the same with the framework set that your front end guy. So, but uh, to support this uh, fallback mechanism, um, you can you can use this approach. Um, actually, this um, this templating stuff is very interesting because it might uh, has a little bit of of logic. So, for example, I will show you another template. So, in this template, it's, it looks a little bit simple, uh, a little bit different. So, because there is a there is a hash in the name. So, when uh, when you see in this dust template, you see the hash. It means that this template or templating engine expects that. Inside your model object that will be applied into this template, there should be array uh, with the names. So it can iterate over this array and read the values from each and every element of this array. So in this case, uh, uh, tutorial. Uh, in this case, there is a how this is the actual object that we're going to apply to this. And uh, in this case, you can see there's a title and there's an array of names. So inside each and every um, element of this template, we'll, uh, inside the, we will put the name as a part of the list element. So, and the result you can see here. So, yeah. And uh, this part was special for people, <laughs> for fans of James Bond. So, I'm, I'm not lying. So, as you can see, um, if I open the source here as well, um, it is just a plain HTML. Um, also, uh, as, as, you might, uh, as you might think, I already show you different pieces of the, how you can use JavaScript as a shell script. The same thing can be used to generate fancy reports, or, for example, instead of writing on the console, uh, this templating can be can be used to generate things. You, you, you can say, okay, there's a very nice uh, uh, template that uh, you can you bought or your designer developed, and uh, you can fit this uh, the template with data uh, based on the um, on the database or using the shell script. It's also available. And uh, again, and uh, the beauty of this is the same same language. It's a JavaScript, and the same platform that you love. It's Java. And um, I will show you a little bit complex page. So this is page I I developed for uh, for uh, Java one. As you can see, uh, this this is the list of the JavaScript sessions. Um, this is JavaScript sessions in Java 1, in Java conference. So as you can see, there's uh, so many uh, the interest in, 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 the, in the community for the JavaScript and Java, how they work together. So it was, you know, very, very, very good sign. Um, and uh, how this uh, template looks like. So uh, when I open it, JavaScript, Java session list. Again, this is template that uh, has pretty nice design. It has like a bootstrap. Um, all these, you know, nice uh, tags. I can I can change. Uh, for example, I don't like this panel primary. I want to say it panel say danger. And when I refresh the screen, nothing's happened. Hmm. What's the type I use here? 
title heading danger danger so it should be it should be here and when I go here no it looks like um, it's it's cached somewhere for some reason um, hmm it's very interesting probably it's uh, yeah like I said it's it's cached in somewhere but um, yeah it, I found bug in my own code um, here also um, uh, in, I will show you the JSON um, very simple JSON um, and again this information can can be populated from from database or the, from the another term party uh, web service I, I don't know whatever um, and again in this case we already have this separation between representation and our model yeah. yep maybe you just uh, went over it but where is this that, that template that you have the dust template it's being filled with the json mm -hmm. data where is that happening uh, on the server side yeah but where is that code for oh what yeah happened? yeah sure so um, let me show you um, So this is like my, it's also, it's my wrapper. I have this wrapper for, you know, you know to, to, to easily add any other framework. So in this case, um, I do have here two things. I have this template and I have this model. So these two files, I'm reading these files from the uh, from file system. It's just gave, it just giving me the text. After that, I'm passing using this, um, um, the thing called bind. Bind, it's, it's, like I said, it's defined your variables that you can pass into your JavaScript. In this case, I, I pass in this template um, with the variable my template and uh, passing my model with a variable name my model. Inside here, when I'm running this engine.eval, this string actually contains JavaScript. So, and this is the API that this Dust framework provides to compile this template. So in this case, this, when I call, ah, you see, this, most likely this template was uh, uh, compiled and stored inside. It's actually, it's, it's a pretty good catch. Um, so, um, what, what, I'm, what, what, I'm, what I'm saying about, what, what does mean this compilation? So, I'm passing the string, but uh, the, the framework, this dash framework, needs to know how to populate the string. And uh, my, uh, my uh, thought that, I remember that thing what I showed you with this, uh, you know, this placeholder, the string with the placeholder, it does, doing pretty much the same. So from this uh, the string, it, will, it, it creates a, a representation that it can easily navigate and, and the feed with data. So um, in this case, I creating uh, this template, I call it servlet, this template. And after that, um, I'm loading this template. This is, again, this is just JavaScript API of this uh, Dust.js framework. And when I select render, this is actually, it, it actually mapped the representation and mapped to, to the model. And again, like I, already, uh, like I already mentioned, because my, my, uh, my script content, uh, context uh, has the customized output, output of this uh, uh, script will be passed in this call. So output, ah, again, it's, it's interesting. So the, um, the render, uh, uh, render function of this does.js um, has first parameter, which is the template name, which is compiled template name. This is name what we've passed here. Also, it has the JavaScript object, so this is why we need to turn the string into JavaScript object instance. And this is the callback. So um, if there is some error happened, uh, the, this variable contains information about error. If uh, during this rendering, during the process of uh, combining the uh, template and the data, if something went wrong, uh, you will get information here in error. And the output is actual result. Because in the JavaScript everything happens asynchronously, so this is why they 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 not uh, doing this uh, you know does dot render equals something or my variable equals does dot render. Um, 
Eventually, when it will you know, do these things, it will invoke this, uh, this function, callback. And inside this callback, I'm just printing out using the writer what I already redefined. Um, maybe it's not very, um, it's not very clear for the first, 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 sorry, for the first time. But um, y y when you will take a look at the code, it's actually it will be more, um, more clear. That actually brings up an like, interesting point, right? The JavaScript is asynchronous. So if you call it in this server component, and if that, I mean, in this case, the compile happened like like that, so you saw it. But, but what would happen if if that spawned off a process which was long running? And you know, the node has the advantage of it; it kind of moves along and doesn't wait for the process to finish. Correct. Yes. So in this case, uh, your executor, your actually, you know, Java wrapper needs to take care of it. So in this case, the eval. This call is asynchronous. Mm -hmm. So this this method is you know it's, it's actually like a synchronous call. So only after everything would be executed here and execution will will be ended. I don't know, they, they figure out they know how you know to, to execute JavaScript. Only after this method would be called. So there's no so, so it will wait in this case. Yeah, so in this case because we in the Java context. Right, right. Again, you can um, you can make this um, I think uh, run this asynchronously. You can spam like a separate thread yeah, to, right. to execute this. So, but in this case, you need to make sure that your server or your RESTful web service is also asynchronous. So when you need to you need to run it on asynchronous context. Mm -hmm. So in this case, um, you don't hold the actual HTTP connection, yeah. but. Uh, uh, eventually, your client will get the result. But uh, yeah, it's a good point. It's, uh, yeah, nice. Um, what else? Ah, yeah, yeah. So I promise you to to talk about a little bit of ASCII doc. So ASCII doc. How many of you heard about Markdown? Markdown. Markdown. Uh, any wiki? Like in the GitHub directory. Exactly. Yes. And uh, any wiki markup. You know that. Writing an HTML files is tedious. You know, we we need we have lots of things more interesting things in our lives to write uh, you know HTML. So this is why the the the, the markup languages are emerged, uh, and uh, the ASCII doc, my personal opinion, and I am ready to you know to discuss it with anyone. It's right now it's the 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 best way to, you know, to, to not write HTML. So in this case, so I spent lots of time with the, uh, the ASCII doc for, you know, how long? A year, I guess. So, and uh, we, 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 all our book is written in ASCII doc. I'll show you how the, it, this looks like, for example. Speaking of which, uh, subline text as well has uh, the very nice um, uh, syntax highlighting for ASCII doc. For example, I'll open. This is my. You can do it bigger. No, I have defined the. Where's the presentation mode? So this is just the text. I'm writing just a simple text. There's no like, uh, that's not the Microsoft Word, nothing. When I want to have a list, I'm just putting a little dash. And uh, in this case, this paragraph becomes the, uh, the list. If I want to I insert some, some heading, there is a different uh, levels that I can use. For example, here, this is the like a, uh, First level heading with two um, signs of equal, um, three signs. If I want to make the something uh, to make it italic, I just need to use um, this um, underscore. Um, also, sublime text. This is you know my 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 little you know hack. So actually this. This is also text, but Sublime Text shows me as italic. If I want to, um, if I want to put something as, uh, for example, as the bold, the, oops, sorry, 
so I, I can use the um, you know the stars. So it's it's pretty easy to concentrate on writing and not think about actual representation how it would look like. So and uh, the ASCII doc is the is the language, but there is a two um, two implementations of the processor. The actual processor will generate output. It will generate HTML, it will generate PDF, it will generate a doc book, and etc. So the uh, the ASCII doctor, um, this is thing which was initially written in Ruby, but um, and it was like a very fast. So comparing to original version of the ASCII doc is the you know you know 100 times faster, um, and. Um, after a certain time, <coughs> some some Java guy because Dan itself he he uh, he was the lead of the ASCII doctor. He's a Java guy, and uh, there's other people came uh, from the Java community, and his friends is Java community, and asking, okay, so let's let's do uh, Java uh, Java something stuff, or let's do something else. So they they come up with Java API, they come up with the even the JavaScript API. So interesting enough that um, the JavaScript API. Is based on the thing called Opal. I don't know the Opal. Yeah. So it's Ruby and there's Opal. There's the, another gem. So um, the Opal itself is the actual implementation of Ruby written in the JavaScript. So in this case, we have this Opal, and uh, we can run pretty much any Ruby code inside this Opal. But I also decided to go even, you know, even even further, and I'll take I'll take these two things called Apal and ASCIIDoctor.js, and I run them through the NAS core. So in this case, so I will show you the original original document. Original document. Where is my resources? ASCII doc, for example, original document. This is a. Um, the announcement of our upcoming uh, the uh, the course. So I, I took it because we were using this uh, the, the ASCII doc uh, syntax almost everywhere. So I, I took it. I took this file as is without any changes. You see, there's a bunch of uh, lists uh, with links and some some formatting. But it looks like a text. But um, let's see what happened if I will run it through the nest horn and uh, the output would be printed in the, on the screen. The first time startup is very you know, slow because I didn't, yeah. So this is how this script, uh, so there's no like a markup any, anymore. So this very nice, very clean, uh, um, uh, very, very, very clean uh, HTML and it was created on the server side when we run the Opal, which is the Ruby implementation, and after that uh, we're running the ASCII doc on this Ruby implementation inside the JVM. <laughs> How cool is that? I think it's, it's awesome. So, yeah, so there's another um, examples of the um, ASCII doctor. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, where is the links? Um, and there is also like ASCII doctor writer's guide. It's a really big file, so it will take some maybe five or four seconds to um, to, pro to to process. But uh, eventually it will, yeah. So it it, sh it show up. So and um, yeah. So all this um, um, all this HTML stuff was generated from uh, from this markup. If I open this, yeah, so oh, you see this is almost 2,000 lines of code, of text, sorry. And again, what's the beauty of this, uh, of this language is you as a developer, you can use your own uh, favorite tools to do div. Uh, you can do, you know, you can set patch, you know, even if you're writing the text, you can use this, uh, these tools. And uh, again, because it's the, just a plain text, um, it has, it, it, um, it, it can be, you know, uh, compacted and zipped and etc. Um, and also, uh, the ASCII doc is supported as the, like you said, as the readme syntax. So, uh, if you're interested to, 
to, to play around. Uh, it's also um, you, you can you can upload your file to 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 GitHub and uh, also print print the result. Um, so this is this is my stories. So do you have any any questions? Because I probably need like more ten, ten more minutes. I have one cool thing also. <laughs> All right. So um, as the restrictions, um, as you can see, the NAS world itself, it's not the full blown browser or something. It's just a JavaScript interpreter. You can write anything because, uh, you know, this is just a JavaScript or Java. For example, it's easy to implement a WebSocket uh, client because right now the WebSocket API is the part of Java 7 and there is a standard uh, Java classes that uh, you can sort of map and pass inside the um, um, inside these, this script. There is no like a WebGL because it's a only like a browser only thing, no HTML audio. But um, yeah, so this is, this is restrictions. We already talked about um, some questions, but last thing I want you to show is, um, you might say, okay, so this is, looks like a very cool stuff and very geeky, very hacking. You, you, you showed the very interesting thing, but what about real products that can use it? What about support of like a big names? And what I can tell you that, um, how many of you heard about Vertex? So for those of you who don't know, you should definitely check. So it's very nice, uh, the framework for writing network applications. Um, you can write a HTTP server, you can write a WebSocket server. And this framework is the polyglot, which means that you can write any language you like to write any piece of the application in the, that language. You can use JavaScript, CoffeeScript, Ruby, uh, JRuby, uh, Jiton, um, Java, Groovy, and uh, let me show you one, one last thing as the bonus. I'll show you the even... Uh, first of all, I'll show you the WebSocket server in couple lines of code. So, and when I open my... So what I do have here, this is very, um, very simple JavaScript WebSocket, um, WebSocket class because the, the Chrome browser supports WebSockets natively. I can use it from the JavaScript. So what this WebSocket server does is just echo server. So when I do, when I need to, uh, when I will send this, uh, I'll send another string. And the server will reply me back with this information. You know, see this is the echo from the server. But actual server, Looks like this. That's it. This is the WebSocket server. Nothing, nothing else. Written in JavaScript, running on top of the vertex. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's a very cool thing. And uh, right now we have so many, so many interesting and uh, so many good um, uh, opportunities to to innovate in the GVM and uh, make our services better, more interesting, more productive, and get more money <laughs> eventually. So, uh, I would like to thank you guys for, for your time. Um, yes, uh, if you have the questions, you can always send me an email, you can send me a tweet, whatever. Um, I will share the, uh, the code, I will brush it up a little bit, I will fix this um, um, nasty bug. And um, that's it. Yeah, so I have the one t-shirt and um, let me, let me ask the question. So I will ask the question, uh, and uh, who will answer this question? So what is the NAS word stands from? Do you understand? Yay! <laughs> Here you go. Yes, so thanks for your time. I'm all, if you have any questions, uh, I'll be here maybe two more minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.